Greetings, welcome to the Crony Corner Channel. Today, we're going to dive into the world of the atomic era, specifically the epic when humanity learned to use atomic energy not only for peaceful purposes, but also for military objectives. Everyone is familiar with Hiroshima and Nagasaki, yet not everyone is aware of the work that went into creating the nuclear bomb. At the heart of this work was Robert Oppenheimer and his laboratory in Los Alamos, nestled within the Manhattan Project. Today, this project appears to us as a myth, a large-scale operation with colossal reactors in Washington State, uranium enrichment factories in Tennessee, thousands of workers who managed all this and were skilled at keeping secrets. We often overlook the reality of this project, replacing it with the image of a heroic secret laboratory in the New Mexico desert and its charismatic director and Soviet spies trying to steal these secrets. Nuclear weaponry has become a unique symbol of power, a true attribute of a major state. It serves as a measure of power in international relations, and therefore many industrial countries in their time aspired to acquire it. However, none of them dared to use it, as it would bring down the whole world. So, let's revisit Oppenheimer's story and learn how the most lethal weapon on Earth was born and how the Soviet Union tried to steal its secrets. My video will differ from others. You won't find a detailed breakdown of nuclear fission physics or chain reactions here. My focus will be on the people and society behind these discoveries. We'll try to understand why we created so many nuclear weapons when a couple of bombs would have been enough for a global catastrophe. We'll figure out why the Cold War became such a military confrontation when the existence of nuclear weapons makes any direct clash between superpowers suicidal. Oppenheimer's quote perfectly titles this narrative, Great scientific discoveries are made not because they are useful, but because they are possible. This thought often comes to mind when I hear the claim that scientists could simply have refrained from creating the bomb if they understood the full depth of destruction it could bring. Yet for Oppenheimer, this passion was decisive. Years later, he would claim that it was these stones that made him a physicist. They made him think about what makes up the world. This was the beginning of his immersion into the world of science. Oppenheimer was a very gifted and versatile individual. He wrote poetry, studied art, was fascinated by history and philosophy. However, science still occupied a special place in his life. In 1922, Oppenheimer enrolled at Harvard University, where he joined a physics course, although he originally intended to study chemistry. In a short time, he distinguished himself as one of the most gifted students. In 1925, Oppenheimer moved to Europe, where he continued his education in Cambridge and then in Göttingen, one of the leading scientific centers in the world at that time. He worked in the laboratory of Max Born, one of the founders of quantum mechanics. This period in Oppenheimer's life was filled with scientific discoveries and intellectual growth. Oppenheimer witnessed the scientific revolution that occurred in the first half of the 20th century. It was a time when physicists were revealing the deep secrets of the atom and opening up new horizons for understanding the nature of the universe. But as we know, this knowledge also led to the creation of nuclear weapons. Oppenheimer displayed extraordinary diligence in learning and a tremendous diversity of interest. This was a testament to how deeply he had immersed himself in the academic environment, allowing him to learn in a wide range of disciplines. He was an extremely enthusiastic and motivated student with an active and broad outlook, which undoubtedly helped him in his later achievements. His interest in Indian philosophy and Buddhism shows how he tried to combine different aspects of his learning and thought patterns. Taking part in so many courses and exams was not standard practice, even for students as diligent as Oppenheimer. This speaks to his immense desire to learn as much as possible about the world around him and his commitment to continuous self-improvement. While most students choose a specific specialization and focus on it, Oppenheimer believed that all areas of knowledge have their significance and can be applied in different spheres of life. 
This integrative approach to education later manifested itself in his work in the field of physics, specifically in the creation of nuclear weapons. But it's important to remember that amidst all of this, Oppenheimer also displayed an forgivable recklessness. His decision to use his knowledge to create nuclear weapons became the darkest chapter of his career. It serves as a reminder that even the most talented and hard-working scientists must bear responsibility for how their work and discoveries are used. His diligence, ambition, and passion for his research are striking. He was an extraordinary learner, and there is much to learn from that. Oppenheimer moved to Cambridge to work with Rutherford, but he initially faced several challenges. As you mentioned, his previous mentor, Percy Bridgman, mentioned in his recommendation letter about his extraordinary learning ability and original thinking, but also noted that he was having difficulties with experimental work. This may have been one of the reasons why Rutherford was initially not enthusiastic about the possibility of taking Oppenheimer into his laboratory. Rutherford, of course, was a great scientist and a significant figure in nuclear physics. His experiments with transforming nitrogen into hydrogen and oxygen by alpha particles are an important example of early work on transforming one element into another. This was a key step in understanding nuclear reactions and technologies that eventually led to the creation of nuclear weapons. Oppenheimer, despite his initial difficulties, was able to overcome them and become an important student of Rutherford. And even though he was struggling with experimental work, his ability for theoretical analysis and assimilation of new knowledge ultimately helped him in his research in nuclear physics. Oppenheimer was exceptionally passionate about his work and dedicated most of his life to it. His statement that physics was more important to him than friends speaks to a deep commitment to his profession. Oppenheimer was a quite eccentric figure, and he clearly used the privilege of his wealthy heritage to satisfy his ambitions and interests. All this, of course, helped him in achieving his goal to create the world's leading school of theoretical physics in Berkeley. Oppenheimer was clearly a person of great influence, as seen from the description of his personal style and impact on students. He was not only a talented scientist but also a charismatic leader who inspired his students and colleagues. His return to America in 1929 Oppenheimer apparently used as an opportunity to realize his ambitions. His acceptance of the offer to work at the University of California in Berkeley allowed him to become a leading scientist in his field and ultimately helped him in achieving his goal to create an outstanding school of theoretical physics. So, Oppenheimer undoubtedly left a significant mark in the history of science and education, and his contribution to the development of theoretical physics cannot be overestimated. Robert Oppenheimer was indeed a unique scientist and figure. His interests and knowledge in many areas made him an exceptional scholar and mentor. His academic works, although complex to understand, reflected the depth of his intellect and understanding of physics. He was known for his use of complex mathematical methods, which made his works challenging even for the smartest scientists. However, this did not diminish his contribution to the scientific community. Oppenheimer was also known for his broad interests that went far beyond science. His fascination with Hinduism and reading sacred texts such as the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads speak to the depth of his intellect and his quest for understanding the world. This unique combination of scientific and philosophical intricacy made him one of the most educated scientists of his time, as confirmed by Nobel laureate Izzet or Rabi. Thus, Oppenheimer's contribution to science and his unique approach to education and scientific research left a significant mark in the history of science and continued to inspire new generations of scientists. Robert Oppenheimer, despite his scientific temperament and passion for knowledge, was far from indifferent to the political and social events happening in the world. In the heyday of Hitlerism, when the Nazis were destroying free intellectual competition in German universities, Oppenheimer, despite his initial detachment from politics, began to take an active interest in this area. 
his actions in support of German scientists fleeing Nazi Germany and his active participation in the anti-fascist movement testify to his deep concern for justice and humanity. Oppenheimer demonstrated his support not only in words but also in deeds, allocating funds from his substantial heritage to help anti-fascist organizations. He also actively disseminated anti-fascist literature among his students and colleagues, trying to influence public opinion. In his personal life, Oppenheimer also went through many changes. He met and married his future wife Kitty Harrison, who was an active communist. This acquaintance further broadened his political views and strengthened his anti-fascist convictions. Thus, during this period of his life, 12 years before the creation of the nuclear bomb, Oppenheimer was not just a scientist in an ivory tower. He was a person who cared deeply about his community, sought justice, and actively acted in accordance with his principles and beliefs. An important part of Robert Oppenheimer's personality was his political worldview. He often participated in the activities of organizations that were considered associated with communism, such as the American Civil Liberties Union. And although he never admitted to being a member of the Communist Party, his activity aroused interest from the Federal Bureau of Investigation FBI, and a case was opened on him. Oppenheimer described himself as a fellow traveler, a person who agrees with many ideas of communism but is not ready to follow all the party's directives. Despite this, his friendships and connections with known communists continued to raise questions. However, when news began to arrive from the Soviet Union about Stalin's harsh treatment of physicist anti-fascists trying to find refuge there, Oppenheimer and many other Western intellectuals moved away from their pro-communist beliefs. Oppenheimer could not fully break with the communist movement, especially because of connections with people, including his brother, who continued to fight in its ranks. In this politically complex and emotionally charged period of his life, a key discovery took place that determined his fate. The fission of uranium, which became the foundation for the creation of the nuclear bomb. This discovery meant that he would play a central role in the most notable scientific and military project of his time, the Manhattan Project, where the first nuclear bomb was developed. The discovery of the neutron in 1932 really opened up new opportunities for research into the atomic nucleus. The neutron, having no electric charge, could penetrate the nucleus of an atom without encountering the resistance of electric repulsion. This opened up new paths for nuclear transformations and reactions, such as fission splitting of atomic nuclei. The discovery of uranium fission in 1938 greatly expanded the understanding of atomic physics. Uranium fission occurs when a neutron collides with a uranium nucleus, causing it to split into two smaller nuclei and releasing a large amount of energy. It is important to note that additional neutrons are also released during fission, which in turn can cause additional fission reactions, creating a so-called chain reaction. The power of the chain reaction and the released energy were so great that this discovery immediately caused a wave of interest and excitement among the scientific community. However, along with the potential for energy production, this discovery also posed the threat of creating a weapon of incomparable destructive power, a nuclear bomb. The various applications of this discovery and its consequences were deeply discussed by scientists of that time, including Robert Oppenheimer. It is known that Oppenheimer was one of the first to understand the military and civilian possibilities of uranium fission, and he made a significant contribution to the development of nuclear energy and nuclear weapons. The onset of World War II and Hitler's rise to power in Germany indeed influenced research in nuclear physics. It was a time when there was a lot of turmoil and fear that Nazi Germany might gain access to weapons of mass destruction based on new discoveries in nuclear physics. In this context, the image of Robert Oppenheimer really emerges, a theoretical physicist who later became the scientific director of the Manhattan Project, the aim of which was to create the first atomic bomb. Two prominent scientists, Leo Szilard and Albert Einstein, 
played an important role in the further development of the atomic project in the United States. Shillard was one of the first to suggest the possibility of a chain reaction, and Einstein, who signed a letter to President Roosevelt, warning about the danger of Nazi Germany obtaining nuclear weapons. In this letter, dated August 2, 1939, Einstein emphasized that in theory it is possible to create a new, powerful type of bomb and that German scientists may be working on this issue. After receiving this letter, Roosevelt established the Uranium Committee, which was the first step towards the creation of the Manhattan Project. Despite the initial skepticism of the American administration towards the ideas of nuclear weapons, as the events of World War II unfolded, it became clear that the issue of developing nuclear weapons was becoming increasingly important, and in the end decisive steps were taken to implement it. Oppenheimer and his colleagues in the U.S. did indeed meet significant resistance and skepticism from the country's military and political leadership at the beginning of the Manhattan Project. The process of deciding to start serious work on creating nuclear weapons was by no means instantaneous, and many factors, including the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, influenced the final decision of the American leadership to invest in this research. One of the key European scientists who significantly contributed to the development of atomic physics was Otto Frisch. Frisch and his colleague Rudolf Peierls were the first to propose the idea of an atomic bomb based on the use of uranium-235. It was they who first understood that a chain reaction could lead to a powerful nuclear explosion. Frisch and Peierls shared their findings with other leading scientists of the time, and they jointly wrote the Friest Pales Memorandum, which described the possibility of creating an atomic bomb. This document was submitted to the British government in early 1940 and served as one of the key moments that contributed to the start of research work on the creation of nuclear weapons. It should be noted that, despite the potential danger and possible ethical questions raised in connection with this research, Many scientists of the Second World War era saw the creation of nuclear weapons as a necessary measure to confront Nazi Germany. Indeed, Otto Frisch and Rudolf Peierls realized not only the potential scientific and technical aspects of creating an atomic bomb, but also its potential ethical and political consequences. In their report, they emphasized that this new weapon would be so powerful that it would be practically impossible to protect against it. They also warned of the possibility of the death of a large number of civilians due to radiation exposure. Germany was indeed working on creating nuclear weapons. The head of this program was the famous German physicist Werner Heisenberg. However, despite the efforts, the German program to create nuclear weapons did not reach its goal during World War II. It is worth noting that many scientists who worked on creating nuclear weapons later expressed regret about their role in this process and called for international control over nuclear weapons and efforts to prevent their proliferation. These issues remain relevant today as the world is faced with the problem of nuclear weapons proliferation and the potential threat of nuclear war. Germany indeed became interested in heavy water from Norway, which could be used as a moderator for a nuclear reactor. Heavy water plays an important role in some types of nuclear reactors, as it can slow down neutrons, making it possible to control the nuclear reaction and create plutonium for use in atomic bombs. While active research and experiments were being carried out in Europe, Work on nuclear technology in the Soviet Union was more limited, as you rightly pointed out. However, Igor Korkadov's discovery of the spontaneous fission of uranium was an important contribution to the development of atomic science. As for Edward Teller, he indeed played a key role in developing the hydrogen bomb in the U.S. Teller was known for his intellect and dedication to scientific research, and his work on the hydrogen bomb became iconic in the history of atomic energy. But his contribution to this field also raised ethical questions, which are still discussed by researchers and historians. It is also interesting to note that, despite the fact that Japan was at war and actively used its scientific resources, 
it was unable to develop nuclear weapons during World War II. This is largely due to the fact that they did not have sufficient resources and equipment, as well as the lack of necessary knowledge and experience in the field of nuclear physics. In the process of creating nuclear weapons, Oppenheimer, as one of the leading scientists, saw the need for close and constant cooperation of all members of the research groups. He assumed that the administrative structure should primarily serve the exchange of knowledge, ideas, and research results, as well as the coordination of efforts. In August 1942, the Manhattan Project was created, the goal of which was to coordinate all research and development related to the use of atomic energy for military purposes. Oppenheimer became the scientific director of the project and the organizer of work in Los Alamos, where the main scientific research was concentrated. Oppenheimer paid great attention to creating conditions for the interaction of scientists of different specialties, since he understood that only with such an approach was it possible to achieve the set goal, the creation of atomic weapons. The effective work of the Manhattan Project led to the creation of the first atomic bomb in 1945, which became a decisive factor in ending World War II. Indeed, Oppenheimer's selection to lead the Manhattan Project seemed questionable to some, especially considering his lack of outstanding achievements compared to renowned scientists like Enrico Fermi. However, General Groves saw unique leadership qualities in Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer possessed deep knowledge not only in theoretical physics but also in philosophy, literature, and many other areas which helped him better understand and communicate with scientists of various specialties. He was erudite, sociable, and able to inspire people, which played a significant role in the successful implementation of the project. Oppenheimer also understood the importance of centralizing efforts, which was confirmed by his desire to gather all scientists in one place. His idea of creating a single laboratory where all specialists would cooperate helped solve many problems arising from the fragmentation of research groups. His contribution to the creation of atomic weapons and his role in the successful completion of the Manhattan Project were so significant that he received the nickname Father of the Atomic Bomb. This confirms that General Groves was correct in his choice of Oppenheimer to lead the project. Oppenheimer's appointment as the head of the Los Alamos laboratory was quite unexpected and even counterintuitive for many reasons. However, it was his unique skills and qualities that enabled the successful implementation of the project. Firstly, Oppenheimer was an excellent organizer and a master of establishing connections. His ability to bring together talented scientists from different disciplines and inspire them to collaborate was key to the successful completion of the project. Secondly, his broad outlook allowed him to delve into a multitude of different issues, from the theory of nuclear physics to practical issues of metallurgy and engineering. This gave him the ability to solve problems that could arise at the intersection of various disciplines. Thirdly, he was not only a leader but also a full-fledged member of the team. Oppenheimer attended important experiments, participated in the discussion of ideas, and kept track of all research. His active participation created an atmosphere of unity and enthusiasm, which was important for maintaining high morale in the team. Many researchers agree that during wartime, scientific progress often accelerates. This is mainly due to the need to solve specific problems or challenges that arise during the war. This can lead to significant funding for research and development, which, in turn, leads to a rise in scientific discoveries and technological progress. The Manhattan Project is a prime example of such acceleration. Indeed, Oppenheimer believed that the war slowed down the development of science, as physics stopped being taught in universities, and the training of new researchers came to a halt. However, this does not negate the fact that war can also lead to accelerated development in certain areas of science and technology when this becomes a matter of national security or an important part of military efforts.
Regarding the process of creating the Los Alamos Laboratory, Oppenheimer undoubtedly demonstrated remarkable organizational ability and leadership qualities. He personally selected scientists for the project, persuading them to leave their comfortable positions at universities and move to a remote laboratory in the New Mexico desert. This required tremendous persuasiveness and charisma. It's also worth noting that Oppenheimer approached the project with deep personal responsibility. He was willing to become a military man and work in this role, but, unfortunately, his health did not allow him to pass the military commission. This, however, did not stop him from making his contribution to the creation of the atomic bomb. In general, this part of history illustrates the complexities and challenges faced by Oppenheimer and his team during the development of the atomic bomb. It was a project that presented scientists and engineers with unprecedented problems and demanded their maximum commitment. However, thanks to their perseverance and talent, they were able to overcome these difficulties and achieve their goal. Yes, the atmosphere in Los Alamos was indeed unique. On the one hand, scientists worked under tense conditions and strict secrecy, but at the same time, there was an atmosphere of student unity in the team, with periodic parties and walks. This helped maintain team spirit, despite the difficult working conditions. Many scientists, including Oppenheimer, were deeply involved in the international scientific community and were used to openness and collaboration. However, under the conditions of war, this community faced new problems. The fear that scientific discoveries could be used by the military led to the closure of many laboratories and restricted access to scientific information. This was a big step away from the open exchange of ideas customary in the scientific community, and many scientists struggled with this change. Nevertheless, even under these circumstances, scientists continued their work, striving to achieve progress in science despite all difficulties. Their research was key to achieving the goals of the Manhattan Project, including the creation of the atomic bomb. Oppenheimer was certainly in a difficult position. He faced a tough choice between his own beliefs and the need to observe military discipline and secrecy, which were part of his work in Los Alamos. Much of the time in the laboratory, each department worked independently from the others to minimize the risk of information leakage. Many engineers didn't even know exactly what they were working on, as information about the final goal of the project was strictly limited. During the project, Oppenheimer faced issues related to his political past. He openly acknowledged that he had been a member of leftist organizations, which raised concerns among some military and security officials. However, despite the potential risks, he continued to work on the project, demonstrating great loyalty to his work and his country. Oppenheimer was not only a great scientist, but also a skilled leader, capable of managing a large and complex project like the Manhattan Project. His decisions and efforts played a crucial role in the successful completion of the project. However, his work in Los Alamos was undoubtedly a severe trial for him as a person and as a scientist. This moment in the history of the Manhattan Project is often referred to as the ignition question, the question of the possibility of igniting the atmosphere as a result of a nuclear explosion. Edward Teller, one of the key figures in the creation of the hydrogen bomb, proposed this hypothesis in 1942, worrying about the possible global consequences of a nuclear explosion. A special group of scientists, led by Arthur Compton, was set up to conduct additional research and modeling on this issue. As a result of these studies, it was determined that the probability of such an eventuality was essentially zero. They concluded that igniting the atmosphere would require much more energy than an atomic bomb could release. However, despite the scientists debunking this hypothesis, public concern about this issue continued to arise throughout the Cold War. The worry about potential global risks of nuclear war became an important factor in the movement for nuclear disarmament and the limitation of nuclear weapons proliferation. Oppenheimer himself continued to play a key role in the development of nuclear weapons, but his attitude towards this work changed over time. 
After the end of the war and the use of bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he became one of the most influential opponents of further development and use of nuclear weapons, advocating for international control and disarmament. This was a time when the world was on the threshold of a new era, the era of nuclear energy. Indeed, the attitudes of the scientists who worked on the creation of the atomic bomb were changing over time. The initial perception of this weapon as a means to prevent a large number of deaths began to turn into fear of the power they had created. Niels Bohr and other scientists began to speak out against the use of the bomb and proposed measures to prevent a nuclear arms race. However, unfortunately, these efforts could not prevent the tragic events that followed, and the world still entered the era of nuclear weapons. This was a complex time, and despite all the efforts, history took its course. It's admirable that these scientists were able to recognize the consequences of their discoveries and did everything they could to mitigate them. This is a vivid example of the responsibility scientists bear for their discoveries and inventions. Interestingly, the desire to prevent the use of nuclear weapons seemed to be especially strong among those who contributed to its creation. There's an interesting irony that Leo Szilard and Albert Einstein, two key figures in the development of the atomic bomb, eventually became active advocates for ending this work. In 1943, they feared that Germany would overtake the U.S. in the race to create atomic weapons. But when this fear dissipated in 1945, they appealed to President Roosevelt, trying to prevent any dangerous plans that the American government might have in mind. Einstein, realizing all possible consequences of using the atomic bomb, claimed that it would bring more harm than good to America. However, unfortunately, he didn't manage to present his papers to Roosevelt, who died without leaving any directives regarding the use of the first atomic bombs. After Roosevelt's death, his successor, President Harry Truman, handled the situation differently. Shortly after Germany's surrender in May 1945, an interim committee was formed. It consisted of five politicians and three scientists, including Robert Oppenheimer. The committee's task was to advise Truman. The committee's findings were somewhat contradictory to the advice previously given to Roosevelt. The question was not whether to use the atomic bomb, but how exactly to use it. The committee recommended dropping the bomb on Japan as soon as possible, selecting a military target located near residential buildings susceptible to destruction. The bomb was to be dropped without warning Japan about the nature of the new weapon. Thus, escalating tensions began to take concrete shape. The initial plan did not involve using nuclear weapons directly against people. However, by the spring of 1945, the situation had significantly changed. Ironically, two key figures who had significantly contributed to the U.S.'s involvement in creating the atomic bomb, Shillard and Einstein, again appealed to Roosevelt, but this time to halt the course of events. Shillard in 1943 had expressed concerns that Germany might overtake the U.S in creating an atomic bomb. But when this threat disappeared in 1945, a new question arose. What other dangerous plans might the American government have in mind? Einstein insisted on the need to stop the arms race, claiming that the use of the atomic bomb could cause more harm than good to the U.S. Indeed, Roosevelt's death left Truman in charge, and his approach to the situation was entirely different. Roosevelt had left no directives regarding the use of the first atomic bombs. After Germany's surrender in May 1945, the interim committee was formed to advise President Truman. The committee, which included Robert Oppenheimer among its three scientist members and five politicians, issued advice that greatly differed from the earlier recommendations given to Roosevelt. Instead of focusing on whether the atomic bomb should be used, the discussion shifted to how it should be used. The committee was unanimous in its decision. The bomb should be dropped on Japan as soon as possible. The chosen target would be a military object located near residential areas that would be destroyed by the blast. 
The bomb was to be used without giving Japan any prior warning about the nature of this weapon. Tensions were escalating. At a time when the first atomic bomb had not yet been tested, scientists from the University of Chicago openly resisted the use of atomic weapons. Throughout the war, they insisted on exploring the civilian uses of atomic energy. The university formed a committee of seven scientists, all of whom were involved in the Manhattan Project, under the leadership of Nobel laureate James Frank. In their report to the Department of Defense, they expressed the following. In past times, scientists could not be blamed for how their discoveries were used for the benefit of humanity. But in our time, scientists are obligated to take a more active stance. Advances in atomic energy research could lead to destruction far greater than any previous inventions. They vividly imagined the horrors that could befall any of their major cities, picturing scenes of destruction far more horrifying than the Pearl Harbor disaster. In their report, the scientists warned the American government about the danger of illusions regarding the U.S.'s long-term monopoly on atomic weapons. They pointed out the significant work being done by French, German, and Soviet scientists, asserting that even with the secrecy of the methods developed in the Manhattan Project, it would only take the Soviet Union a few years to catch up. They also noted that the use of atomic weapons would make the U.S more vulnerable, given its many large cities and industrial centers. From the perspective of these scientists, it was in the best interests of the United States to either achieve an international agreement to prohibit the use of nuclear bombs or, at the very least, to avoid actions that could prompt other nations to produce them. The scientists who signed this document carried such significant authority that the Department of Defense couldn't ignore their statement and passed it on to the scientists in the interim committee. According to Oppenheimer, the scientists were asked to respond to the question of whether the atomic bomb should be used. Oppenheimer believed the question of using the atomic bomb was raised because a group of renowned and respected scientists had presented a petition calling for its non-use. Ideally, of course, this would have been preferable from all viewpoints. They had a limited understanding of the military situation in Japan, not knowing whether it could be forced to surrender by other means or how necessary our invasion of Japan was. However, the idea of the inevitability of invading Japan was ingrained in their minds, and they added that in their opinion, detonating one such bomb over a desert would not produce a sufficient effect. Thus, Oppenheimer supported the idea of bombing a city, but first, it had to be tested whether the bomb would explode at all. The test of the first bomb was scheduled for mid July 1945 by General Groves. On the 12th and 13th, active preparations were underway. Part of the projectile was secretly transported to the Alamo Gordo area and hoisted onto a metal tower in the middle of the desert. These were the most anxious days for both Oppenheimer and General Groves. Would the bomb explode or not? At 2 a.m. on July 16, all participants in the experiment were at their designated places 15 kilometers away from the so-called Ground Zero. The explosion was scheduled for 4 a.m., but due to bad weather, it was postponed until 5.30 a.m. Fifteen minutes before the scheduled time, everyone put on dark glasses or lay face down on the ground, turning away from ground zero. At 5.30, a bright white light, brighter than the daytime sun, flooded with clouds and surrounding mountains, marked the explosion of the experimental bomb. The force of the explosion far exceeded all scientists' expectations. The nearest measuring instruments were completely destroyed, indicating that atomic weapons are instruments of mass destruction. One of the witnesses to the explosion described the situation as follows. We knew the world would never be the same again. Some people laughed, some cried, most were silent. Oppenheimer, it seems, was taken aback by the power of the bomb, gripping one of the control posts. He recalled a line from an ancient Indian text, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. So spoke the divine Krishna, toying with the fates of mortals. But Robert Oppenheimer was just a man, on whose lot fell an incredible power. His reaction was a simple and concise phrase. I think it worked, as recalled by Brigadier General Thomas Farrell, 
who had laid a great responsibility on Oppenheimer. Even more tension enveloped Oppenheimer in the last seconds before the explosion. His breath was held, he leaned against a post with his hands so as not to fall. For the last few minutes, his gaze was fixed on the horizon, and when the announcer exclaimed now, and a blinding flash of light followed, a look of relief appeared on Oppenheimer's face. At the first gathering in Los Alamos after the explosion, Oppenheimer took the stage, clenching his hands in a sign of victory, like a boxer who is applauded by the crowd. He expressed regret that the weapon had been created too late to use against Germany. This was on August 6, and a few hours later a bomber dropped a bomb on Hiroshima. Despite the fact that Oppenheimer supported the idea of bombing Japan, he, like many of his colleagues, was upset by the destruction of Nagasaki. He felt that the second bomb was not necessary from a military point of view. On August 2017, he went to Washington to hand over a letter to the Secretary of War, in which he expressed his disgust and a wish that nuclear weapons be prohibited. In October, Oppenheimer met with President Truman. The meeting went badly. When Oppenheimer mentioned that he felt blood on his hands, Truman flared up and kicked him out, telling his secretary he never wanted to see that son of a in his office again. But a few months later, the president did award Oppenheimer a Medal of Merit. After Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Manhattan Project became known to the general public. Oppenheimer became a national celebrity, his photos were printed on the covers of Time and Life magazines, and discussions about the use and danger of nuclear weapons became part of public dialogue. Most of the scientists who worked on the Manhattan Project saw the explosions of atomic bombs and the end of World War II as their liberation. They were frightened by the terrifying destruction but proud of their achievement. The world learned about the terrible danger of nuclear war, and perhaps this realization will help prevent new wars. However, scientists became even more concerned when they saw that instead of relaxing the army's control over nuclear secrets, the control was actually strengthened. Moreover, attempts began to diminish the extent of destruction of the Japanese cities and the danger of radiation. General Gross even stated before a congressional committee that death from radiation was quite pleasant. Many scientists tried to counteract this narrative. Many physicists from leading research institutes united to publicly inform about the potential dangers of atomic weapons and demand their international control. Oppenheimer, however, took a different position. He did not publicly oppose nuclear weapons, instead trying to save his laboratory from disintegration. As I mentioned earlier, many scientists began to return home from the desert, where they had worked for the past few years, believing their work was done. Oppenheimer convinced them that their work was not yet over, and proposed to continue their joint efforts. But by October he had stopped trying to retain the scientists, realizing that the lab would never be the same, and he himself resigned. Los Alamos had played its part in Oppenheimer's fate, and he could now hand over the lab to others. He returned to the academic world, became a consultant to politicians and generals, and participated in the development of a plan for international control over atomic energy, which the U.S. planned to offer to the U.N. Teaching, however, did not work out for him. After two years, he left his native Berkeley and accepted an offer to become director of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. This institute was known as one of the leading scientific institutions in the world and existed on the account of generous private donations. Its employees were scientists from a wide range of fields, including economists, philosophers, mathematicians, and physicists. Oppenheimer's office was located in a beautiful building surrounded by magnificent trees. At that time, it was the highest pine job of his life, $20,000 a year, plus free housing in a 17th century mansion with its own cook and gardener. Oppenheimer got used to a comfortable life, bought expensive European furniture, and collected works of art. His collection included works by Picasso, Rembrandt, Renoir, and many other famous artists. Scientifically, he had almost moved away from active research and was not participating in new projects. 
Oppenheimer actively participated in the development of the so-called Barrick Plan. This plan envisaged the creation of an international body to manage atomic energy, which would possess all the materials capable of a chain reaction, their means of production, as well as atomic power stations where they could be used for peaceful energy production. But the plan was perceived as an attempt to preserve the U.S. nuclear monopoly, and the Soviet Union rejected it. After this, Oppenheimer realized that an arms race was inevitable. The path to the hydrogen bomb began in August 1949 when photographs taken in the upper layers of the atmosphere from an American bomber showed that an atomic bomb had been detonated in the USSR. This was not a surprise to Oppenheimer, but the American authorities were shocked. The magazine leading the campaign against the arms race put on the cover of each issue a clock showing eight minutes to midnight, the so-called doomsday clock. After the report of the explosion of the Soviet bomb, the hand was moved to three minutes to midnight. The USSR had tested much earlier than expected in America, which sparked rumors of a possible leak of secrets from the Los Alamos laboratory. This became apparent during the debates on the need to develop a more powerful hydrogen bomb. Oppenheimer knew about the possibility of creating such a weapon since the Manhattan Project, but then he preferred the development of simpler nuclear weapons, as speed was more important than the power of the explosion. After the war, when asked whether it was time to start creating a hydrogen bomb, Oppenheimer's first reaction was restrained, if not hostile. He was shocked by the destructive power of nuclear weapons, the damage zone of which could exceed the size of any military object and even cover entire states. Oppenheimer perfectly understood and emphasized that in the case of a nuclear war, many countries could be completely destroyed. The members of the interim committee came to a unanimous opinion that the creation of thermonuclear weapons would damage the moral reputation of the U.S. Despite the fact that these were the same people who approved the bombing of Hiroshima, they persistently urged President Truman to publicly refuse to develop a hydrogen bomb and suggest the USSR to do the same. All members of the interim committee were unanimous in their opinion that the creation of thermonuclear weapons would be inappropriate and dangerous. This confrontation lasted three months, and during this time many prominent political and military leaders sided with the opponents of the new weapon. However, on January 31, 1910, President Truman ordered the start of work on the creation of a hydrogen bomb, which shocked many scientists. Contrary to the law, government agencies confiscated and destroyed several thousand copies of Scientific American, in which famous physicist Beth called for scientists to speak out against the creation of a super bomb. Oppenheimer, like many others, was confused by the president's action. He even thought about leaving the interim committee, but eventually decided to stay. Half a year later, the Korean War began. In this situation, Edward Teller, a physicist who was most actively promoting the idea of the necessity of a new super bomb, was able to attract the majority of scientists to his side. At the start of the project, there were serious theoretical difficulties that threatened the entire project. However, the problems were resolved at a general meeting of physicists in Princeton, shared by Oppenheimer. It turned out that everything could be solved quite simply, and the first experimental explosion could be carried out within a year. When later asked why he spoke against the creation of a hydrogen bomb in October 1949 and then suddenly started advocating for it, he explained that at the time it seemed to him that the project's implementation would be technically challenging and unlikely. Oppenheimer participated in the creation of the super bomb, but at the same time, he continued to think about how to limit its use. It was even said that in November 1951, he presented General Eisenhower with a plan to use nuclear weapons in the event of a war in Europe. The doubts experienced by many nuclear scientists, especially those like Oppenheimer who embraced the idea of the relativity of every truth, were quite typical. 
Oppenheimer developed a plan for international control over the production of nuclear weapons, assuming that American hegemony is unquestionably positive and provides peace and democracy for all humanity. By the way, about democracy and military secrets, we have not gone far from the Manhattan Project. Let's talk about how much Soviet spies were actually able to steal all the secrets from there. This story is closely related to the names of Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. They were a real married couple and, as it turned out, really worked for Soviet intelligence. It was Julius Rosenberg who recruited his brother-in-law, David Greenglass, who worked in Los Alamos in February 1944. Rosenberg also managed to establish a connection with a second source of information about the American Atomic Project, engineer Russell McNutt, who worked on the installation's projects at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. For this success, Rosenberg received a bonus of $100 from his management. McNutt's work gave Soviet intelligence access to the secrets of the weapon-grade uranium production process. In addition, Klaus Fuchs, a distinguished scientist, also turned out to be very important for the USSR. Fuchs was not just an engineer, but a truly valuable physicist who had access to all the leading scientists of the Manhattan Project. Klaus Fuchs worked in the theoretical physics department of the Los Alamos Laboratory and was the author of several methods for calculating the energy of a chain reaction. His report on shockwaves is still considered a classic. Fuchs was one of the witnesses of the first atomic bomb explosion in July 1945. His lab supervisor described Fuchs as one of the best theoretical physicists. And despite all of this, Fuchs deliberately worked for the USSR. Over the next two years, Fuchs handed over to the USSR theoretical sketches for the creation of a hydrogen bomb and key data on the separation of uranium-235. It could be said that Fuchs was the most valuable agent of Soviet intelligence. However, in the end, it was because of him that the entire spy network was exposed. Fuchs was arrested in England, and then his liaison was arrested. After that, David Greenglass was exposed, who in turn gave up his sister and her husband, the main organizers of this group. In the end, the Rosenbergs were executed in the electric chair, and the other network participants were sent to prison for many years. J. Robert Oppenheimer publicly condemned the execution of the Rosenbergs, but this did not help. It should be noted that he spoke out not because he considered them innocent, but because he believed the punishment was too harsh. On this issue, he was in the minority, as many then considered the charges against the spouses to be absurd. Only after the collapse of the USSR were documents published that confirmed the Rosenberg's connection with espionage in favor of the USSR. During World War II, the USSR and the USA were allies, but the Americans did not share with the Soviets information about their progress in nuclear physics. Therefore, the USA was shocked by how quickly the Soviets were able to conduct their first nuclear test. From here arose the assumption of stolen secrets. Klaus Fuchs, one of the key figures in this story, was indeed a significant scientist. However, to this day, discussions continue about how useful the information he passed on was. Most scientists agree that at the time of his departure from the project in mid-1946, too little was known about the mechanism of the hydrogen bomb for his information to significantly change anything for the Soviet Union. There have been many attempts to assess the significance of the stolen American data for the Soviet atomic project. There is no consensus, but most agree that the USSR could have developed an atomic bomb without espionage, it just might have taken longer. Some argue that the earlier development of the Soviet atomic bomb could have affected the course of the Korean War. Despite this, even assuming that all the secrets of the atomic bomb were stolen, this would hardly have helped Soviet physicists. The head of the Soviet atomic project, Lavrentiy Beria, only used information from espionage for additional verification. He did not trust this information and feared that it could be disinformation. Therefore, before handing it over to the scientists, he first checked what they could come up with on their own, 
and then ordered another group to verify this according to information from the United States. Because of this approach, it is difficult to assess how useful the stolen information turned out to be. Oppenheimer, also known as Open Gamer, criticized the execution of the Rosenbergs, but it had no effect. While he did not assert their innocence, he believed that the punishment was overly severe. Many at the time considered the charges against the Rosenbergs to be implausible, and only after the collapse of the USSR were documents published confirming their espionage activities in favor of the Soviet Union. During World War II, the USA and the USSR were allies, but the Americans did not share information about their progress in nuclear physics. As a result, the appearance of the Soviet atomic bomb was a shock for the USA, and there was a suggestion that secrets were stolen. Klaus Fuchs, one of the key figures in this story, was a significant scientist, but there are still debates about how important the information he passed on was. Most scientists agree that by the time he left the project in 1946, too little was known about the hydrogen bomb for his information to significantly help the USSR. Many have tried to assess how important the stolen American data were to the Soviet atomic project. There is no consensus on this issue, but most believe that the USSR could develop an atomic bomb without espionage, although it would take more time. Meanwhile, Oppenheimer began to lose influence. After his term expired in August 1952, President Truman refused to reappoint him, wishing to include in the committee new voices supporting the hydrogen bomb. Oppenheimer gradually became less authoritative in the eyes of the authorities, and with President Eisenhower's coming to power, he was less often invited as a consultant. Oppenheimer continued to participate actively in public life, becoming a member of many committees, including the State Department's Disarmament Consultants Group. He urged the U.S. to postpone hydrogen bomb tests and seek a ban on thermonuclear tests from the USSR, but these ideas found no support. In 1953, a group released a report that, under Oppenheimer's influence, painted a pessimistic future where neither the U.S. nor the USSR could achieve nuclear supremacy, but both could inflict severe damage on each other. McCarthyism, named after Senator Joseph McCarthy, was characterized by anti-communist paranoia in the U.S. in the mid-1950s. This period in history proved extremely unpleasant for many intellectuals and public figures, including Robert Oppenheimer. On December 21, 1953, shortly after Oppenheimer's return from England, where he gave a series of brilliant lectures, he was summoned to the Atomic Energy Commission. At first, everything was normal, but then he was hit with serious charges based on details of his past life. The charges included five main points. Oppenheimer had been in contact with communists during the war, was in love with a communist, and married a former communist, as well as funded the Communist Party until 1942. He hired communists or former communists to work in Los Alamos. He gave conflicting testimonies to the FBI about his participation in communist rallies during the war. Oppenheimer rejected the proposal to pass scientific information to the Soviet Union but did not immediately report the conversation to security. In 1949, as the chair of the Atomic Energy Commission's advisory committee, he strongly opposed the creation of a hydrogen bomb. All these facts were known, but in the context of McCarthyism, they were used to portray Oppenheimer as a potential agent of the Soviet Union. Even testimonies against him from Sylvia Grouch, a former communist who held the position of professional informer during McCarthyism, were included in the case. It was known that the FBI had been watching Oppenheimer even before the war, suspecting him of membership in the Communist Party. Oppenheimer called for more openness and less secrecy on issues related to the nuclear threat. Nevertheless, as the Cold War progressed, the atmosphere of fear and suspicion became increasingly tense, and Oppenheimer faced significant difficulties due to his views. 
During the war, surveillance of Oppenheimer intensified, but until the McCarthy era, this didn't attract much attention. Only in the time of which hunts were details of Oppenheimer's past life used against him. His opponents, including a commissioner of the American Atomic Energy Commission, whom Oppenheimer publicly criticized for supporting the hydrogen bomb, exploited this situation to their advantage. William Borden, the executive director of another atomic energy organization, wrote a letter to FBI Director Hoover, essentially accusing Oppenheimer of communism and working for the Soviet Union. Hoover, who was always focused on the red threat, immediately rushed this letter to President Eisenhower. President Eisenhower did not express direct trust in Hoover, but he agreed to continue the investigation. He quickly ordered Oppenheimer to be cut off from access to any state or military secrets. When charges were brought against Oppenheimer, he was offered either to voluntarily leave the Atomic Energy Commission or to undergo an investigation. He chose the latter. The trial took place behind closed doors in the spring of 1954, but the transcripts of the sessions were published in the summer, and the case caused a significant stir in the educated society. Although Oppenheimer had disappointed many in the past due to his indecisiveness and passive attitude towards the arms race, he suddenly became a symbol of the madness of the witch hunt politics. He was never a radical political activist and often collaborated with the authorities, but his usual restraint and tendency to be evasive became a vivid example of the consequences of McCarthyism. No one for a moment thought that the portrayal of Oppenheimer as a Soviet agent could be anything more than an absurd idea. During the trial, the only physicist who testified against Oppenheimer was General Gross. However, he did so under pressure from the FBI, which threatened to make him an accomplice to a crime, recalling how he did not follow the security service's recommendation to dismiss Oppenheimer from the directorship of Los Alamos. Despite previous wariness, physicist colleagues almost unanimously supported Oppenheimer in court, possibly out of a sense of solidarity. Of the 40 scientists who appeared in court, only Edward Teller, the lead developer of the hydrogen bomb, supported the prosecution. Teller stated that although he considered Oppenheimer loyal to the U.S. government, his actions were complex and confusing, and he would prefer that the vital interests of the country were in more understandable hands for him. This caused anger in the scientific community, which rejected Teller and effectively excluded him from academic science. Oppenheimer received support not only from scientists, but also from many ordinary Americans who respected him as the man who gave America the weapon that determined the outcome of World War II. Only one incident emerged during the trial that touched on Oppenheimer's reputation, the story of how he revealed to the Security Service information about his acquaintance Chevalier over a minor issue. However, even this could be interpreted in favor of Oppenheimer, highlighting his reluctance to aid the Soviet Union to the point of finding spies where there were none. Today, thanks to the works of biographer Ray Monk and analysis of declassified KGB documents, we know that in his youth, Oppenheimer was indeed a supporter of the Communist Party and even funded it, but during the Manhattan Project, he was not a Soviet spy. He not only did not spy for the U.S., but also removed several people sympathetic to the Soviet Union from the project. As a result, the court gathered a full set of all the new and unresolved problems that scientists faced during the Cold War. At the dawn of the atomic age, a question arose about the new role of scientists in society and the impossibility of their life under strict control, which could lead to the loss of the ethical values on which science has always been based. However, the result was as follows. The accusation of Oppenheimer's collaboration with the USSR was dismissed as absurd. The judges understood this, but at the time the country was rife with hysterical hunts for communists, and the administration was intimidated by Senator McCarthy's wrath. It was enough that Oppenheimer had once sympathized with the communists and did not show enough enthusiasm for the development of the hydrogen bomb. Oppenheimer was deemed a traitor, and by majority vote, 
it was decided that his candidacy was unacceptable for positions related to access to military secrets. His contract with the Atomic Energy Commission was terminated, but by the standards of that time, he got off easily. However, in public opinion, he became a vivid example of a victim of senseless political terror. He was perceived as a martyr who suffered from military aggression. Werner von Braun, the German physicist who worked on the first ballistic missiles, ironically noted that while America marked Oppenheimer as a traitor, in England he was almost honored and even knighted. The Federation of American Scientists protested against the official isolation of Oppenheimer, a great citizen and scientist who had long been an important government advisor. The Federation warned that the indictment of Oppenheimer could have unintended consequences. If now a government consultant can be suspected based solely on his opinion that does not coincide with the official line of the state, then scientists might reconsider the possibility of collaborating with such a state. In the following years, Oppenheimer's international reputation steadily grew. The man who earned the title of father of the atomic bomb became a symbol of the scientist trying to understand his responsibility to the modern world and accept it in full. In his articles and lectures, Oppenheimer constantly returned to the issue of the relationship between science and society. Nevertheless, these were primarily philosophical works. After World War II, Oppenheimer published only five scientific papers, and after the 1950s, none. Nobel laureate Murray Gell-Mann summed it up this way. Oppenheimer did not have the patience to sit at work for a long time. In his work, Oppenheimer seemed not particularly keen on long calculations and complex scientific works. His works were usually small, but bright conceptual contributions. He often lacked the patience to do detailed calculations, but he was able to inspire others to make scientific discoveries, and his influence on other researchers was quite significant. He remained such an inspire even after the end of his career as a scientist. Oppenheimer often returned to the issue of the relationship between science and society. One of his ideas seemed particularly interesting and even contradicted the accepted view of science popularization. Oppenheimer argued that with each new complex scientific discovery, the gap between the scientific community and ordinary people widens. Even among scientists, differences in understanding arise depending on their specialization. He argued that science will never be as understandable as it once was. Scientific theories based on mathematics have become inaccessible to most people's understanding. Unlike Newton or Galilea, modern scientists cannot explain their discoveries without distortions to the general public. This has become the prerogative of small groups of specialized scientists, and this creates serious problems for the popularization of science. According to Oppenheimer, all attempts to popularize science, regardless of the level of education of the listener, are doomed to failure. He claimed that he never had to hear a simple and correct explanation of quantum theory or the theory of relativity intended for the general public. He saw this as a big problem undermining the authority of science in the eyes of society. The second important theme that Oppenheimer often returned to was the responsibility of scientists for their discoveries. He asked whether scientists can consciously refuse dangerous directions of research. For example, you can recall the story of Max Born's assistant, a young English woman named Helen Smith. Upon learning of the existence of the atomic bomb, Helen Smith, former assistant to Max Born, decided to abandon a career in physics and become a lawyer. Probably, one can find other cases of this kind, but these are mainly individual decisions, representing an attempt to escape from their own inner conflict, not to solve a global problem. Those who decided to go this way early on found relief. They were no longer tormented by remorse and awkward questions. However, giving up physics does not solve the problem of the existence of nuclear weapons. In 1954, Hans Beth, 
one of the creators of the hydrogen bomb, spoke of his experiences, saying that he always felt a deep anxiety that his actions were mistaken. Albert Einstein also regretted drawing Roosevelt's attention to the possibility of creating nuclear weapons, saying, If I knew that the Germans would not be able to create an atomic bomb, I would have done nothing. Oppenheimer did not express such regrets, but in 1956 he said, We were working for the devil. He acknowledged that many of the physicists involved in creating the atomic bomb were deeply disturbed and morally tormented. So could the scientists working on the atomic bomb at some point stop the process that led to the creation of weapons of mass destruction? Heisenberg, a German physicist, claimed that if a small group of scientists in 1939 decided that atomic energy should not be used for military purposes, history might have turned out differently. Even after the first test of the bomb, scientists, including Oppenheimer, could have prevented the tragedy in Hiroshima. However, Oppenheimer chose another path. Although he hesitated when deciding on the creation of a hydrogen bomb, in the end, he joined the work on it, rejecting the existence of other reasons for hesitation, except technical ones. During and after the war, Oppenheimer often returned to thoughts of conflict between science and power, of the need to protect the values of Western civilization. He warned that without this, progress could slow down. Like Einstein, Oppenheimer feared that the Nazis might be the first to create nuclear weapons. Einstein persistently asked Roosevelt to prevent Hitler from gaining a monopoly on the atomic bomb. Helen Smith, assistant to Max Born, upon learning about the atomic bomb, made a decision to retrain from a physicist to a lawyer. This is probably not the only case when a scientist changed professions, trying to avoid a moral conflict associated with the military use of his work. However, such a refusal from science does not solve the global problem of the existence of nuclear weapons. In 1954, Hans Beth, one of the creators of the hydrogen bomb, admitted that he was constantly worried about whether he had made a mistake by participating in its creation. Albert Einstein expressed regret for directing President Roosevelt towards the development of nuclear weapons, saying, If I knew that the Germans would not be able to create an atomic bomb, I would have done nothing. Robert Oppenheimer, while not expressing regrets, stated in 1956, We worked for the devil. He acknowledged that many of his colleagues involved in the creation of nuclear weapons suffered moral distress. Scientists involved in creating nuclear weapons were faced with a choice, continue their work or try to stop the process. German physicist Werner Heisenberg claimed that if a group of scientists decided in 1939 not to use atomic energy for military purposes, history might have taken a different course. After the first successful test of the atomic bomb, Oppenheimer and his colleagues could have prevented the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. However, Oppenheimer chose to continue his work, believing there were no other grounds for doubt aside from technical ones. Oppenheimer was concerned about potential conflict between science and power and the need to protect Western values from it. He also expressed fear that if the Nazis were the first to create nuclear weapons, it could lead to their victory. Einstein supported this view and urged Roosevelt to prevent the possibility of Hitler gaining a monopoly on the atomic bomb. As we discuss whether scientists should bear responsibility for creating the most destructive weapon in history, we must remember the circumstances under which it was created. The atomic bomb itself is an evil, but an atomic bomb in the hands of the Nazis is an absolute evil. Oppenheimer understood this and took responsibility for creating the bomb and for its use. This was his decision. They were not acting as scientists but as citizens whose profession put them in a position to possess valuable information. In 1955, the president of the University of Washington canceled an invitation for Oppenheimer to give a lecture series because a law was passed in Washington banning the Communist Party. This angered students, 1,200 of whom signed a petition in protest. The director was even burned in effigy. The director's decision was ultimately reversed, but Oppenheimer's lectures never took place. 
This is just one example of how differently authorities and ordinary citizens perceived Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer died in 1967. He was a heavy smoker all his life and was diagnosed with throat cancer two years before his death. He went through surgery, radiation therapy, and chemotherapy, but with little success. Eventually, he fell into a coma and died at his home at the age of 62. Today's science continues to confront nations and governments with difficult questions and potential outcomes that it reveals in its daily research. One such potential scenario is a nuclear winter, which could be accompanied by global epidemics and mass starvation caused by disruptions in food supply systems. Regrettably, the ongoing arms race indicates that we have not yet realized that the traditional system based on the uniqueness of each state and international conflicts has become suicidal. But there is a chance for change, because the choice is crystal clear, either accept change as the only alternative to mutual destruction. We are forever in a situation where the world can either be destroyed or transformed into a closer and more harmonious community. Now it's time to start dismantling the death machine, and the energy we spend on creating deadly technologies should be directed towards improving life. Undeniably, the atomic bomb drastically changed the world. Oppenheimer once found a succinct metaphor to describe this change in one of his speeches in 1946. And I would add, we are faced with a choice between a new world and its complete disappearance. Thank you for reaching the end of this video. We've dealt with some very important and heavy topics, and I hope they made you think. These are questions that deserve our attention and discussion. Now, more than ever, we need to talk about what steps we, as a society, should take to improve the future and avoid the catastrophic scenarios that await us if we leave everything as it is. I'd very much like to hear your thoughts on this. Please leave your comments below and let's discuss this together. After all, it's our common world, and we all have the right and duty to care for it. And remember, conversation is the beginning of change. Thank you again for watching, good luck to you, and see you in the next video.